So today what I'm going to cover is uh, I'm going to introduce these libraries that a lot of people use out there. Um, underscore.js for functional programming utilities. Uh, Backbone.js for working with models and events and require.js for dependency management so separating your code across many files with different modules that depend on one another um, and the kind of example application that I'm going to build is a polygon editor where you can add vertices to the polygon and remove vertices and move them around um, using this notion of model view controller where the model is like the data of the application, the view is the presentation of it, and the controller is the piece of code that takes uh, user actions and uses those to man manipulate the model. So I'm going to get started here. I'm in an empty directory. First thing I'll do is get underscore. So underscorejs.org is the documentation. It's really good. And uh, I'm going to download the development version. Um, but first, I'm going to think about the directory structure. So I'm going to make a directory called uh, JS to contain the JavaScript, and a directory JS slash lib to contain the uh, libraries. And then I'm going to get this uh, underscore library. Here's what we can do with uh, underscore. So underscore is loaded in the in the browser on the unders or underscore page itself. So you can click, you enter underscore, and it evaluates to this thing. There are functions for collections like each. So this is like a replacement for JavaScript for loops. You know, it makes it more Ruby-like or whatever. So you can do underscore dot each. And the first argument is going to be an array, like one, two, three. And the second argument is a function that takes an item as an argument. Um, so for each item, I'll print it out. Console.log item and it prints one, two, three. Isn't that cool? So it takes as one argument in the array and another argument of function that's going to be applied to each element in that array. Uh, so this is like a typical functional programming uh, thing. It's also map. Uh, if instead of each we call map, this function will be applied and then the return value of the function uh, will populate a new array. So instead of printing it out, I'll return uh, items times two. So I'll double the value of it. So now I have two, four, six. Another common one is reduce. That will combine all the elements of a list together in a certain way. Um, this is what re reduce looks like. So say we want to add all these numbers together. Uh, we could pass a function that takes two items, A and B, and returns A plus B. So what this will do is, um, uh, I think it will take the last two and call those as A and B, and then the return value from the function will be called with one. So it should call, you know, this function with two and three, it'll return five, and then it'll call this function again with five and one, or one and five, and so it'll fold the, you know, the results together so if I execute this, I get six. There's also nice functions for ranges, like underscore dot range. Ten will give you an array of ten integers. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm passing in the function with, you know, an inline function like a lambda, you know. But what you could also do is define the function, a function square of uh, x that will return x times x so square of 5 is 25 right so 
we can use map and pass in the function itself. And this will square, it'll apply this, this function to each element in that array and then build up the array based on the return values. So we get the squared numbers, one, four, and nine. So these are the functional utilities, you know, a little bit of them. There's a lot more. And there are also neat things for working with uh, objects. Like, you ever want to combine two objects? So imagine you have um, an object uh, x is 5 uh, and an object like y is 7. And you want an object that has x and y uh, both. You can use this underscore uh, extend function. So underscore dot extend one object, another object, uh, x5, y is 7, and we get the object that has both of them combined. Um, this is used a lot for doing inheritance in JavaScript, as opposed to using prototypal inheritance. Um, you can just add objects together. So you can make a new object and then extend it with another new object, and all it does is copy all the properties from one object to another. I'm going to combine these three libraries, underscore, backbone, and require. So I've introduced underscore. Next I'll introduce backbone. So let's go to the backbone site, and I'm going to get the library. So I'll copy this into my terminal here. I'm in the lib directory, so I'll just grab it. The Backbone library is also loaded into this page, so you can play around with it, too. Backbone is used a lot for events, uh, and has a really nice event API for adding and removing event listeners to objects. So, um, and this code has this little button here. You can actually run this code in the page. So if I run this, uh, it says, oh, I triggered an event. But let's look at this. It creates a new object literal that has nothing in it, and it calls underscore dot extend with that object and backbone dot events. So this is sort of the way that backbone is supposed to be used. You extend existing objects, so it just copies all the properties from backbone dot events into the object. And then one of those properties is dot is uh, the on property, which is a function you can call. So object dot on. Uh, the first argument is the name of the event, and the second argument is a function that gets called when that event gets triggered. And then you can call object.trigger, the name of the event, and some object that you pass to all the listeners. That's optional. So let's fire up our uh, terminal here, JavaScript console, and you can type stuff in there. It gets evaluated. So we have backbone. It's some object. And uh, let's let's do this. Let's type this so so we can learn it. You know, so var I'll call it o equals some empty object underscore dot extend o backbone dot events, and we can see these are the uh, properties that it's been extended with on, once, off, trigger, stop listening, uh, all this stuff. So if we, we can add a, add a listener to this um, by typing o dot on, uh, let's say change event, an event called change. Uh, and we can call the events anything. It's not like there's preset events. Because when we, when we trigger the event, we need to use the name of the event. So change and then a function that will, I'll just print out console.log uh, changed. So now, if we type uh, o.trigger change, as the argument, 
uh, we, we, it prints out ch changed. It called that function. One way of using Backbone is just using the events. Another main part of Backbone is the notion of a model. So a model is um, kind of like a class, and you can create instances of the model. And on an instance of the model, uh, you can set properties and get properties, and whenever you set those properties, events get triggered that says those properties have changed. So here's, a here's some example code that they give you. Uh, if I run this, I can enter a CSS color, say red, and it's made the sidebar red. Uh, what the code does is uh, it makes a new model, you could say like a class, think of it as a class, and then it makes a new instance of that, and it, it, it adds an event listener. So on change colon color, so that's the, the event name convention for listening for changes on certain properties. And if you just use change, uh, you'll get the event no matter what property is changed. Like, you'll get an event when any property changes. So this function just sets the CSS color of the sidebar. Uh, and here, it calls sidebar.set color white. So that'll set it to be white. And then it calls sidebar.promptColor, which is this function here that you know, prompts us to enter a color and then calls this.set uh, color colon CSS color. So let's, let's play with it a little bit. Uh, var, I'm going to make a, a new model called uh, x. Or no, I'll call it foo, you know, whatever. You, you can make a new model directly without extending Backbone's model. Uh, we could use it like that. So new backbone dot model. This is how we set properties. Uh, foo dot set. And set takes an object as an argument. And the object is, you know, key value pairs. So if I want to set foo dot x equal five, you know, uh, the key would be x and the value would be five. So now if I call foo.get x, the string x, it gives me five back. So Backbone kind of introduces a new way of working with objects. Um, so if you use this set and get these functions rather than just a, using the properties directly, Backbone gives you these events when you set it. So to see that, we can call foo on uh, change a function that prints out the value of x. So on change, print the value of x. So I enter this, you know, nothing happens, but if I call foo.set x to be a 9, say, uh, I, it, get, it gets printed out. And with the set notation, we can actually set multiple properties using the single argument. So if I want to set x and y, I can do it like this, pass in an object with x and y, and then I can call foo.get y, and it'll give me 90, like what I set. And Backbone also has uh, collections of models. I'm going to set that back to white. Um, yeah, collection. So a collection is a like a list of models and it works out the events such that y if you listen for an event on the collection, uh, that event gets triggered anytime any one of the models in that collection triggers that event. So say so you, you have a, a list of objects, point objects, and you want to know when any of them change. You can listen on the change event uh, on the collection. And the events from each individual model will get sort of forwarded to the collection. So we'll use that in our, exa our graphical example. Uh, but I just want to give you a little tour in, this, in the terminal here. Uh, we can make a new collection 
var uh, foos, like many foos, equals uh, new backbone dot collection. Uh, and you can also listen for events of adding and removing objects from this collection too. So let's try that. Foos dot on uh, add and there's a preset list of events somewhere in here uh, and add is one of them. So here's the backbone catalog of events. You can look at this um, to find out which events you want. So I'm going to use the add event. So on add call this function I'm just going to print out uh, added We have our foo already, our one, our one model. It's already there. So we can add that to this foo's collection. Uh, so foo's.add foo. And that event get, got triggered. Um, and we can add uh, more things, like a new backbone model. Uh, that has nothing in it, say. And so if we listen for a change event on the collection, so here we can do that, foos dot on uh, change. So uh, when, it, when it gets the change event, I'll just print changed. And so if I call foo, not foos, but foo, which has been added to the collection foos dot set um, x to be 99, we get changed. As in, this changed is from the listener on the collection. So this is kind of a basic tour of Backbone. There's a lot more functionality in Backbone to do with synchronizing with servers and using Ajax and stuff like that. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about that stuff today. So the next library is require.js, which lets us decompose our code into many files that are sort of interdependent. So requirejs.org is the site. Uh, looks like this. I'm going to download the latest release. going to grab it with curl. So this library is one we'll have to actually use locally to see it working because it deals with files. So our directory tree looks like this. We have JavaScript, lib, uh, require, underscore, and backbone. So here I'm going to actually start the, this little project of a polygon editor that's going to use these libraries. So I'm going to start making uh, index.html. So this is going to be the main page where the application loads. Uh, and it's just going to be a, a sort of standard HTML page uh, template thing. So begin HTML. Uh, begin head, end head, begin body, end body, and HTML. So let's look at the required JS documentation to see how to use it. Um, the API. So here's how we define modules. Let's see. Here's how we tell it where the main script is and where to look for things that it will require. So I'm just going to copy and paste this little snippet into the head of my document here. But instead of scripts, I'm using JS. So I'm going to change scripts to JS. And I'm going to call my program app.js. 
And I've got this lib directory going on, so I'm going to add that here. It's looking for require in the lib directory. And it's going to look for a file called app.js, which is not there yet. I'm going to add it right now. So we've got app.js. So we call it require, which is given by require.js. And the first argument to require is a list of strings. And each string is the name of a module that will be loaded into the namespace. Uh, I'll just give it an empty array for now because we don't need anything. And the second argument is a function. that takes as its arguments each one of those modules after they've been loaded up. Uh, but right now, let's, you know, it doesn't really do anything. So I'll just test this to see if this code is working. Hello, AMD. So AMD is Asynchronous Module Definition, which is uh, a module definition API that require.js implements. So I'll write all this. This is all the code, um, and hopefully it works. Let's see. So I'm going to just take the working directory and paste it into the URL bar. I should get this page. And the terminal, sure enough, says, hello, AMD. So it worked. So far, so good. So this is all we have, just a script that's loaded with require.js. So require.js is in a class of libraries that you could call script loaders. Um, it's sort of inconvenient to load many scripts with many different script tags in the case where each script depends on some other script. And you have to kind of track down the dependencies and get the order correct when you type the page out. So to avoid that nightmare, as the code bases get bigger and bigger and bigger, uh, people have invested a lot of effort. And this is like sort of the most modern like standardization of the idea that scripts should be able to specify which other scripts they depend on. And then have this library automatically resolve the order that they should be loaded in. And that's what this library does. Uh, so you can specify with this library a dependency network between all your scripts. So, I mean, it's critical to have this kind of thing for large code bases of JavaScript. So, I'll define my first module now. Um, so, I'm in the root here. Oh, I'll make a snapshot right now. So now in this repository, I've got snapshot 2 with the code here that we're looking at right now. So, okay, we've got these two files, index.html and app.js. And in app.js, let's say I want to require a module, uh, my module. So I add it to that array of modules, and I add it as an argument to the function. So in the array, it's a string. And we pass require.js this string, and the library loads uh, the file called mymodule.js. And it you know, runs it. It extracts that module object. And we'll see what that means in a second. And it gives you, it calls this function with that module object. So you can call functions on it. So Let's, let's say there's a function in my module called uh, say hello, right? And we don't have that module yet. So I'm going to edit the file js slash my module.js. And the syntax for defining modules with require.js is you call the define function. And it's a lot like the require function where the first argument is a list of dependencies and the second argument is a function. And the return value from this function is what's passed in as, as the argument here when you require the, the thing. 
So I've got the function, I'm just going to return an object literal where one of the properties is say hello. And that's a function. And all that function does is hello my module. So this should work. Um, because when we specify data dash main, it said in the documentation that the uh, required.js loads all code relative to a base URL. And uh, when you use this like way of using it, there are a couple other ways you can use required.js, like with a configuration file, but this is kind of the simplest. Uh, it says, this sets the base URL to the scripts directory because it's scripts slash something, and it's gonna use that as the base directory. So in our case, it's using JS as the base directory. So it'll look for files in that directory. So hopefully everything's in order. It should work. Okay, it still says hello AMD. So this is a, an issue I've run into with require.js. When you use it by just loading files from the, the hard disk like this, like there's no web server here, it's just loading the file. And the file gets cached. And there's a, a nice thing you can do with require.js. Um, first of all, let's look at the configuration. Um, after you've loaded require.js, you can execute a little bit of script that calls require.config. And the stuff that you pass into require.config is, is like sort of evaluated and taken into account in how require uh, functions. And there's a special thing to do with the cache where uh, you can say URL args equals bust equals you know the current time as a string. So it'll add that to the end of the URL each time it tries to load it and that will effectively cause the browser not to use old versions of the scripts and modules that you define. So I'm going to copy this little snippet and add a script tag right after we load require.js and then call require.config and pass it as an argument um, an object literal that has just this URL arcs property. So this should fix our problem with the caching. Hello, my module. Okay, it worked. And uh, if we look at what's been actually loaded here in this page, if we look at the uh, network tab here in Chrome, it tells you the requests that have been sent. And to get the app.js file, it actually called this uh, URL with this, this parameter that was ignored, and the file was just returned. And so same thing with my module. So this is useful for debugging, because it happens a lot with debugging. I mean, development. It happens a lot in development, where you, you, you want the file to get the new one all the time. But I guess in, in production, that should be disabled. I'll, I'll do one more sort of level here where I'll add another module that gets depended on by my module. So you can see it working sort of recursively with m many modules. Uh, so if my module requires another module, and that also has a say hello function, say. And this will call define. It doesn't depend on anything. It returns an object literal that has uh, say hello. Which is a function uh, that just prints out uh, I'm another module. So 
So it's sort of a, a kind of convoluted pattern. I'll just go through it so you really get it. So it's calling a, this whole script is just calling the defined function that's given to us by require.js. The first argument is the list of dependencies. The second argument is a function that's called with all those dependency modules loaded. And then the return value of that function is used as the module when it's required. And I'm just retur returning an object that has one property, say hello, that's a function that does this thing. So now we have this dependency chain. I'll load up the other file too. Um, so here's the main app. The main app requires my module. And my module requires this other thing, another module. So we have this sort of two links in the chain. And the point of this is just to show that require.js resolves the dependencies in the right way. So here it worked. Hello, my module, I'm another module. And they're from different files, which is pretty nice. So now I want to use the model view controller idea to build up this graphical application using Canvas that uses these uh, libraries. So this is the basic idea of model view controller. The model contains the state of the application, like the data that represents the state. And when the model changes, the view changes, which the user sees. And when the user interacts, like click, clicks the mouse or something, that mouse clicking code is implemented in the controller. And all the controller does is change the model. So there's no coupling between the controller and the view except for the model. So the view, you know, often with this pattern you have the, um, the observer pattern, which is these events and the callbacks. So the model usually has events that are listened to by the view, and then when the controller sets something on the model, you know, the model generates those events, the view gets it and updates or re-renders. So we can see how Backbone plays into this. So we're just going to use the Backbone events on the model and have the controller call set on the Backbone models and then have the view be listening for change events on the model. So let's start by defining the model module. So I'm changing now app.js. I'm changing my module to model. You know what, let me just take a step back and look at our tree here. Oh, it's all convoluted now with the snapshots. But anyway, if you ignore the snapshots, <laughs> this is what we have, a JavaScript directory with a lib, and then an app, and then the modules. But uh, I'm going to teach you something more about require.js. You can put the modules in directories and then use those directories to refer to the modules. Uh, so I'll close all this stuff. So in the JS directory, I'm going to make another directory called app that's going to contain the model view and controller modules. Um, I'm going to move these modules that we made into there. So now in app we have these test modules. I'm just going to rename them and reuse the code. Um, so my module will, be, will become model and uh, well, let's just start with that. We have model here. So when we look at app.js, we require model, but this is, this is going to look in the same directory where the app is, but we've put it in a subdirectory called app. So to get this module, we can use app slash model in this string that we pass to require.js. So this is where it loads the module from, the app directory.
So I will open this file and I'll get rid of this dependency. The models are not going to depend on anything. And what am I going to return? I'm going to use Backbone. I'm just going to return a... Uh, well, let's think about what we want to do here. So what we want to do is make a polygon editor. And a polygon is a list of vertices, right? Each vertex has an x, y coordinate. So actually, what the model is going to depend on is let's make another module that encapsulates that vertex object. And the vertex object is going to be drawn on the screen as a circle. And those circles are going to be connected to one another with lines uh, when we have the thing done. So I'm going to make another module app uh, slash vertex dot js. Has no dependencies. It's a function that returns, well, a new backbone model. I'm just going to make a new backbone model. So yeah, the vertex is just a new backbone model. We can change it later to add different methods and things. Uh, but the problem right now is the index.html doesn't load the backbone library. So we just need to change it to add that script. So here's the index.html page. I'm going to add a script tag. where the source is js slash lib slash backbone dot js. Uh, and backbone actually depends on underscore. So I'm going to load underscore first. So now the underscore and backbone should be global variables that we can use in anything. Yeah. So you need to add a script tag for every single library? Yeah, you need to add a, a script tag that includes each library that you're going to use. Oh. Unless those libraries are defined as AMD modules, in which case you can use uh, require to load them dynamically. But it just so happens that underscore and backbone are not written in such a way that they can be used directly as uh, modules. I mean, people have made copies of them, like forked them, and then added some special code to make them accessible with uh, require.js. Um, but it's kind of involved to use those, so I'll just do this for this introduction oh, okay. thing. So we've, we have these libraries loaded up. I've created this file, vertex.js, that just returns a new backbone model. Oh, how do we want to use this? Vertex is going to be like a class where we can call new on it. So I'm actually doing the wrong thing. I don't want to return a new model. I want to return, uh, see, backbone model uh, extend, I think is what I want. This is how you make your own kind of, they're, they're almost like classes. Um, and the object you pass into extend is, are the, um, the methods that are going to be inherited in the prototype of the new objects that you create. But we're going to leave it empty for now. So I'm going to return backbone.model.extend with nothing. So that should give us a new thing that we can call new on and create new uh, models. So here's the model. Um, the model, in, in terms of the model view controller thing, is going to be a collection of vertices vertex objects. So we really just want a new backbone collection. Um, and when you make a collection, you can make your own collection type that knows which model it has. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to copy this little snippet. 
Okay, so we've got this stuff. Uh, var, I'm gonna call it uh, vertices. Is a extension of backbone collection where the model is this vertex model. And we don't have that in our namespace here, so we can require it by adding it to the dependencies. It's going to be app slash vertex. And then what we return from this is going to be the model of the model view controller. So we're going to return uh, a new instance of this thing. See, this is how it's used. Um, Oh, it's not, there's no example right available. It was underneath model. Return new model. Well, anyway, we make a new instance of that. Return new vertices. So this should be a backbone collection now, where you can add these vertex models to the collection and get the events that you're interested in. So over in the main app, we're just requiring the model and not really doing anything. So what I'm going to do is uh, just add an event listener to the model and add one vertex to the model just to test if everything's set up properly. So model.on change whenever anything changes. Or actually, let's start by listening for when things are added. So model.on add on the add event execute this function that just prints out um, added to model. Uh, and then we can add something to the model and see if this event gets fired. So model.add, which is we get from backbone, a new vertex object. Uh, but we don't have vertex here, so we'll have to add it to our dependencies. So, so now we have it. It should be loaded for us. And so when we run this, it should just print add it to model. Uh, if all is well. Let's, let's hope. Let's see. It worked. Add it to model. So let's define a view that will show us the content of the model. I'm going to close some of these. I'm going to close vertex. So here I have uh, view.js. I'm going to define a module that depends on the model, because the view needs to see the model. The, the view needs to get updates from the model. So it's a function that takes model and I'm going to take this listener that we wrote over here and just add it here and uh, well the view in this case is going to be some code that renders the model to the canvas. So in the view we need to get at the canvas like and, well first we have to make a canvas on the page. <laughs> So in the body, let's make a canvas element. Give it an ID of canvas. Close the tag. I'll give it a width and height too. So if you give an element an ID, it automatically gets assigned to a global variable. So that means that we can just use the canvas variable. That will be this node, this DOM node. So that means that in the view, we can just say var c, as in the, the canvas context, is canvas.getContext 2D, sort of the standard boilerplate thing for using the canvas. 
So, the, but the canvas variable sh is there because it's the ID of this element, and it's magically added as a global variable. So we could just use it as is. So let's make a function called uh, render model, or just render. I'll just call it render. Yeah, I mean, amazingly. I didn't know that. So I just refreshed the page. And it worked. There it is. Like, amazingly. So let let me just confirm. Like, if I change the ID of it, if I make the ID G, I can get G, and it's the canvas object. So... So yeah, a little known fact. <laughs> it sort of goes against. I mean, I see it, I believe it. I mean, but it's, I know it's it surprising sort of to me too. The whole thing about polluting the. the I know. I know. Tell me about it. Tell me about it. So it's funny. I posted the first uh, HTML5 thing that I did here on YouTube, and then some YouTube user BK1 Music, you know, posted this comment. Hey, you don't. You can just use the variable. It's already there. It is what it is, right? Oh. <laughs> so when we want to render, we want to traverse the model. And it just so happens that Backbone, in its collection objects, each collection has these underscore methods already there, like each, or for each. So if you, you, we, we can just call model.each. And we can pass a function which renders one vertex. So I'm going to make a function render vertex. Pass that function in. Uh, and that function will be here. And the argument to this function will be one entry in that model. And I'm just going to grab some HTML5 canvas circle code. Uh, yeah, we need a begin path, an arc, and then a stroke, or a fill. So a C dot begin path, C dot arc, and it's center x, center y radius. So vertex dot x, and vertex dot y. But notice we haven't used those. They're not there yet. So when we add to the model, we should give this vertex by passing an object into the constructor an x and y value. So I'll give it x as, uh, say, 100, y as 100, radius. I'll make a, a module local variable called radius and say 20. 20 pixels would be the radius that we're going to draw these things. And then the other arguments are 0 to 2 pi. As in, it's an arc. The way you draw a circle in Canvas is you draw an arc from 0 to 2 pi. And I think that's it. And then C dot close path. And then C dot fill which will fill in that arc that we just made. So I've created the view module, but I haven't used it in the main file. Uh, so it's not going to get run. But all I want to do is run this code, which will set up the view. So to do that, I'll add it to my uh, require list in the main app. I'm still back on this thing, but this is amazing. Yeah, isn't it amazing? So now it's requiring, it's going to load in that view file and set it up to work. And then uh, on add, we're just console.logging here, but what I want to do is whenever it adds, I want to re-render, right? So I can pass in the function uh, render. 
and this should work. So whenever it gets the add event, it calls the render function. So let's see if this works. This should render a circle at 100, 100 pixel uh, XY location. So I'll write everything. Canvas is not defined. Hmm. Oh. Right, I named it G. So I'll move it, I'll change it back to canvas. I'm not seeing it rendered. All right, so it's not rendering anything. Let me just confirm that renders being called. Yeah. Okay, it's calling the render function. It looks like it. You have canvas there, but. Oh yeah, I have the canvas. Oh, it's because I need to use vertex dot get. Yeah, I can't. I remember. I just can't. Can't just use the properties. So var x equals vertex dot get with a string x. Yeah, it's like the backbone way of doing it, you know? So it doesn't actually add the real properties because then people would start setting the properties and, it, and the events wouldn't get fired. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't it forces you to use the set and get. Yeah, so, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, so now I can use this uh, X and Y. Hopefully this will work. All right. Whew, after one hour, we got this. <laughs> okay, so let's just uh, test and see if we add another vertex. So model.add another vertex at, say, 200, 200. We've got two circles. Okay, it's working, you know, so far so good. And let's just test the fact that the events are working. So I'm gonna put this second one in a set timeout. So a set timeout takes a function and a number of milliseconds to wait. So say one second. So I'm telling this so this should add the second circle one second after the page loaded, and based on the way we've set it up, it should re-render after a second. It worked. Amazing. And so now let's add the controller, so mouse interactivity. So now we're at snapshot three, with the two circles being added. Okay, so now we've got the controller. Let's define a module that depends on well we're going to the controller is just going to depend on the model because it's going to have to change the model uh model so let's see what does the controller really do it it he handles mouse events so since canvas is there as a global variable we can say canvas dot add event listener. Uh, mouse move. Well, let's do mouse down as a first one. So mouse down uh, add event listener takes a function that takes the event argument. I'm going to call it e that has the pos the mouse position. I'm just going to print out the mouse position e.pageX e.pageY just to see if it's working. So it's not going to get, this code's not going to get called unless we include it in the main app. So I'm going to require model view and also the controller here. And then here in the function view controller. Even though we don't use it, I'm just putting it here so it gets loaded. So now let's write everything and whoa. It can't get the model. Oh. Cause I need to I need to make it app slash model. 
because if I, if I just use model, it will look for the model.js yeah, directly. So require app slash model. And then if I click, yeah, see, it's printing out the stuff. So this corner should be 0, 0. And so it looks good. One other thing I want to do before we move on is uh, make the canvas justified up against the corner so we can use the mouse location directly. So to do that, I'm going to add some inline CSS to the body. Just make the margin zero. So now you see it's uh, right up against the edge. So let's make it so that when we click, it adds a vertex at the place where we clicked. So we already have this little snippet, model.add this thing. Uh, and here in the controller, when we get the mouse event, let's do the same thing, model.add a new vertex where the x is e.pageX and the y is e.pageY. It's not working. Vertex is not defined. Okay, so we need to require vertex also. So here it goes, vertex. So now we've got it. it. Should be available to us. Okay, so now when I click, it adds to the model. All right. Uh, so the original intention was to make it a polygon editor, but we're not drawing the polygons, we're just drawing the vertices. <laughs> uh, so let's change the view to draw the lines between. And also I'm going to get rid of this set timeout thing. All right, so we just need to change the view to render lines between each vertex also. And I think I'll draw them smaller. I think that I'll make the radius uh, 10. And then in the render function, uh, model dot each render vertex. So this will render each vertex. But I guess before we do that, we should render the lines between them. I'm going to use the same thing, model dot each, but make an inline uh, function here. So we want to get each pair of vertices, each pair of adjacent vertices. So the way I'm going to do this is if uh, previous, if there was a previous vertex, then do some stuff. And previous I'm going to have a, as a variable here. So the first time through it's going to be empty, nothing's going to happen. And the current vertex I'm going to call C-U-R-R -R for current. The previous and current. Uh, at the end of drawing this stuff, which is going to be inside that if statement, I'm going to assign the previous to current. So we have the, the pair. So if previous exists, well, current definitely exists. So if we're in this block of code, we have both. And we can draw the line. And the code, the, the API call for drawing a line with the canvas is c.move to x, y. Uh, so I'm going to say pref, previous dot get x and get y. Um, I think we need a, a begin path. C dot begin path and C dot close path at the end. Uh, when we move to this point, and then after we move to that first point, we want to make a line from that point to the next point. And the call for that is line to. So I'm going to replace uh, previous with current. And then uh, stroke that path, as in draw the line. C dot stroke that, that path. So now if, if we run it, it's oh, unexpected token, 10, line 10. 
Oh, I'm missing a close parenthesis. Okay, so we're we're making polygons. Sweet. So we can add vertices, but that's all we can do. Right? And actually it doesn't close the path. We could add the code to close the path too. So I'll make a snapshot of this. Number four. So the last couple things I want to do is make it so that you can move these points around once they're there. The line segments. So is that you're kind of buffering, I guess, the, um, the beginning and the end, so you draw it all at once. Is that like a performance? Notice I'm actually calling stroke for each line segment. Yeah. Um, and then I'm rendering each circle. So the way that the Canvas API is implemented, I mean, keep in mind that JavaScript is single-threaded. Yeah. So the way the Canvas API works is as you're calling all these functions, it's rendering it to an off-screen buffer. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the code stops, you know, as soon as this, this one thread that's running uh, stops executing, what happens is it goes back to the JavaScript event loop. No. So I think what happens is as soon as you call any function that mutates the content of the canvas, uh, a p an internal piece of code is scheduled for the next time the JavaScript event loop gets you know freed up. Okay. That will actually buffer that to the display. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're right. It's 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 drawing it all to an off-screen buffer, and then once all my code is finished, uh, it'll you know dump it to the display. So what I want to do next is make it so that you can drag these around. So what I'm going to do is uh, in the controller instead of uh, just adding a vertex, I'm going to first check, is the mouse over an existing vertex? And if it is, then use that vertex as like the vertex to be dragged. So I'm going to make a variable that's local to the module called uh, Ver vertex being dragged. And initially it's it's going to be nothing. It's going to be null, right? But so here whoa. Vertex being dragged equals uh find vertex under point. E dot x uh, and e dot y. So e dot page x, e dot page y. So I'll make this function find vertex under point x y as the arguments in pixels. And uh, so we want to traverse. So I'm going to do a linear search through this this collection of uh, vertices that we have in the model. And uh, you could do a for loop and then find the first one and approach it like that. But keep in mind, Backbone has all these underscore methods on the collections already. And one of those functions is called find. And what find does is you give it a list and it, what they call an iterator here, which is that function uh, that returns true or false. And as soon as that function returns true, uh, then the find function returns the corresponding item. So I'm going to pass this, uh, well, I don't need to pass it to the list because it's already sort of incorporated. Uh, I'm going to call model.find with a function that will take as input one of the vertices, so vertex, and it will return true if this vertex contains the point, as in like the circle drawn on the screen that represents this vertex, if that circle contains this mouse point, then this function should return true. Ideally, I could just ask the vertex, do you contain this point? And it could tell me yes or no. So I'm gonna do it that way. Vertex.contains 
which is a function that doesn't exist yet. I'm going to make it uh, x comma y, and I'm going to return this. So model dot find each vertex. Well, find returns only one thing. Oh, and I have to return this also. So return the first uh, vertex that's come across uh, where vertex dot contains the point returns true. So in the vertex object, so here we just have a simple backbone model uh, and it doesn't have anything. But what we can do is give this vertex, uh, you know, class. You can think of it as a class, but it's not really. I mean, it's a backbone model, but it's class-like in that each vertex object will inherit all the methods that you put right here. So I'm going to put a method called uh, contains, which is a function that takes uh, x and y and uh, in this function we can use the this object and the this object will be bound to the vertex that's being called on so what we want to do is check uh, is the because we're dealing with circles right we want to check is the distance between this xy point and the xy center point of the vertex less than the radius that's being used. I mean, problematically, this radius is actually defined inside the view. It should be in some common spot. But actually, just to get a first pass working, I'm gonna hard code it, and then I'll refactor once it's working. So when a vertex contains a point, it means actually the circle of the vertex contains the point. So I'm gonna make a module local thing called radius equals 10. I'll refactor it later so it's in one spot, but I'll put it here for now. So we need to compute the distance between these two things. And the distance is the Pythagorean theorem, right? So it'd be the square root of, um, I'm going to make separate variables here, dx, as in the difference between the x's, and dy, the difference between the y's. So it'll be dx squared plus dy squared. And then dx will be uh, x minus this dot get x as a string. The backbone way. And same thing for y. And I'm going to put all my variables in the same statement here. So here we have the distance and now we can return distance is less than or equal to uh, the radius. And then in the controller, so in the controller we're finding it, we're not using it. Uh, let's say if if there is a vertex found, then uh, do this stuff. But actually we want, if there's no vertex, then add the vertex. If there is a vertex, it's not going to do anything. So this is a simple way to test if the function's working. Um, so to test it, I'm going to you know, make a vertex in empty space, and if I click on that vertex, it should not make a new one, you know, if the code's all working properly. So, refresh. Oh, square root's not defined. The math button. Yeah. Math dot. Okay, so I'm clicking, clicking, and it's not doing anything, which is the correct thing. And if I click outside, it creates a new one. But if I click an existing one, it doesn't. But if I click right outside, it makes a new one. So our, our testing code is working properly. I'll just say radius here is 10. And I'm going to make a property here called radius. 
And if I put it in here, it'll be at the prototype of each of the vertex uh, instances. So if I call vertex dot radius, I'll get this. It'll 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 walk the prototype chain because the the new instances don't have a local version of radius. So I'm going to put the radius here. Uh, and so where's the other thing? It was in view. So I'm going to get rid of this line radius equals 10. And then where I use the radius, I'm going to use vertex dot radius equals vertex dot um, radius. I think this will work. So now if I change the radius in here, it should change all over the place. So now it's 20. Okay, looks good. So now we want to make it drag the circles. Right, that's the whole point of doing this. So that's in the controller. So, okay, we've assigned vertex being dragged. And now we want to listen for when the mouse is moving as part of this drag uh, gesture. So we can add another event listener, canvas.addEventListener mouse move. And in this case, if there is a vertex being dragged, then we want to reset its location to be where the mouse is, right? So vertex being dragged dot set. And here we can see how nice it is to be using backbone because we can set two properties at once with one object. So we give it an object literal that has uh, x as e dot page x. And y as e dot page y. So this should work. As in, this should actually let us move the vertices around. But let me look at the view here. When are we actually re-rendering? Oh, I added change also. Okay, so add and change. So when we call set here, it should actually fire this change event, which would re cause it to re-render. So let's see. Okay. So we are not clearing the canvas. So we've made like a painting app. So in the, in the view, uh, in the render function, before we render anything, we should clear the canvas. So the API call for that is c.clearRect0, 0, zero uh, canvas.width and then canvas.height. Okay, it works. Check it out. We can, oh, oh, but if I release the mouse, it's still, it's still dragging around. So, yeah, we need, we need to listen for the mouse, uh, mouse up. So, could you just, change that boolean to be vertex being very false? So vertex being dragged is actually not a boolean, it's the object itself. Oh, oh. But in JavaScript, things can be truthy or falsy, right? So I can put it in an if expression. So if it exists, then it's true, but if it doesn't exist, then it's false, okay. falsy, yeah. <laughs> right? So it's not true, <laughs> it's not truth, truthy. <laughs> So in the mouse up function, we can just set it to null. Or undefined, do, 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 do make, wouldn't make a difference. Uh, so okay, write every, all these files, let's see, does it work? It seems to be working. So it's really now resembling a real program that does something. <laughs> Success. <laughs>
So let me just put the finishing touches on this. I want it so that when you click on an existing one, when you just click on it, it gets deleted. So this would be like add, move, and remove. It would cover the full spectrum, you know? So let's see, how would we do that? Um, what we could do is keep track of where the vertex being dragged was when we started dragging it, and then see if, uh, when we stop dragging it, see if it's in the same spot. And if it hasn't moved, then it means that the interaction was just a click and without a drag. And that, that gesture should be deleting the thing. So I'm going to make some module local variables like drag start x and y. Drag start x, drag start y. Uh, we're going to have to store them because they're going to be changing as it's dragging, right? In the actual vertex. So on the mouse down, I want to, so I'll paste it right here. So if there is a vertex under the mouse, then store this stuff. Otherwise, add a new one. So drag start x equals uh, e dot. Actually, no, it's it's not necessarily the same as the mouse. So drag start x equals vertex being dragged dot get x, like that. And the same thing for y. So we've got the drag start. And on the mouse up, if there is a vertex being dragged, And uh, the, it's a lot of stuff to type. I'm just going to copy it from above. So if so, as we're releasing the mouse, oh, this line of code needs to be at the bottom too. So if the vertex being dragged is there, and if uh, drag start x equals equals vertex being dragged dot get x and uh, drag start y equals equals vertex being dragged dot get y. So in this case, what we want to do is uh, remove this from the model. So this is a function we haven't really seen yet, but it's there. Model.remove vertex being dragged. Simple. So let's let's see if it uh, works. So we can add them, we can move them, and if I click on one, it doesn't do anything, but if I drag the other one, it's gone. So it means we're not getting that remove event. So to get that remove event in the view, we need to just add another line here on remove. So here, when, when, when things are added, removed, or anything in the model is changed, then we call render. So now, we should be able to move this stuff around. And if I click on this one, bam, it's gone. So. Just for the sake of completeness, I want to close that gap. I think what I'll do is initialize previous to be the last one in the collection, which I think there's a method for that. Um, last. There it is. The last. So model.last. Let's see if it works. Yeah, it's working. So it, don't you see how amazingly, how much more productive these underscore methods make you? You could just type one line of code as opposed to like writing out some crazy loop 
that like does some, yeah. You know, it's very Lisp-like. It's very Lisp-like. There's so much code reuse that happens. Yeah. So I'll make the radius 10. And this is snapshot number five. And it's, it's pretty much done. It works. Got our polygon editor. I'm just gonna do some last minute cleanup here. So previous will always be defined. And I wanna fill in the polygon. So I'll take these outside and fill it with a color. 